Hello ladies and gentlemen. Okay, today we're going to cover photosynthesis, which is the process by which plants, bacteria, and certain kinds of protists make food, which is sugar and other compounds, by using sunlight as an energy source and carbon dioxide as a carbon source, and it releases oxygen as a byproduct. There are two key uh, things you need to know. Photoautotrophs use sunlight and the process of photosynthesis to make their food. Heterotrophs have to obtain their energy from other organisms. So in other words, they have to either eat plants or other animals or so on. So if they don't make their food, they're heterotrophs. If they're photoautotrophs, then they use sunlight for energy and they make their own food. The yearly worldwide production of sugar by plants is about 220 billion tons worldwide. They all focus on using light as their energy source. So we need to take a look at the electromagnetic spectrum for a moment. Organisms use only a very small range of wavelengths for photosynthesis, vision, and other processes, which is the small portion that is drawn out in the bottom of this picture. Most of the wavelengths are the ones we see as visible light, which is a small part of the electromagnetic spectrum from the sun, but you can see that it goes from all the way from radio waves to gamma rays. Light energy is packaged as photons, which vary in energy as a function of their wavelength. Photoautotrophs only use the range of 380 to 750 nanometers of wavelengths for photosynthesis. The pigment molecules on the chloroplast inner membranes absorb these photons. Chlorophyll A and B pigments absorb the blue and red, but reflect the green, which is why leaves are green. Carotenoid pigments absorb the blue-violet and blue-green, but reflect yellow and orange and red, and so carotenoids we see primarily as oranges. Xanthophils reflect yellow, brown, purple, or blue light. Anthocyanins reflect red and purple light in fruit and flowers. Phycobilins reflect red or blue-green light, and are accessory pigments found in red algae and cyanobacteria. A pigment absorbs light of specific wavelengths by acting as an antenna to receive photons of that specific energy. So you can see here that plants have a range of different pigments. Most plants have more than just chlorophyll A or chlorophyll B or both of those. They also have those accessory pigments like the anthocyanins, like the carotenoids, and so on. What that means is, is that if they get suboptimal light, so it's not in the blue and the reds, but if they get lights in the greens and yellows, they can still survive. They can still make their own food, albeit at lower levels because they have fewer of those pigments. The chlorophylls and green leaves will mask the accessory pigments until autumn when the chlorophyll content declines. Because basically what happens is the plant, the chlorophyll is extremely expensive to produce for the plant. Um, it is energetically expensive. And so what the plant does is it harvests that chlorophyll back out of the leaves before it drops those leaves off in the autumn. Um, the accessory pigments, like I said, are, are much fewer of them. And so it just leaves them in the leaves and kind of cuts its losses. Okay, this is an overview of the photosynthesis reaction. There are two stages of this reaction the light-dependent reaction, and, th and the light-independent reaction. In the light-dependent reaction, light energy is converted to the chemical bond energy in ATP. Water is split to release oxygen, and NADP plus picks up electrons to become NADPH to be used later. The light independent reactions assemble sugars and other organic molecules using ATP, NADPH, and CO2. Overall, the equation of gluco for glucose formation is written as 12 H2O plus 6 CO2 over sunlight gives you 6O2, C6H12O6, and 6H2O. I have simplified that equation with the one on the screen because that's really kind of the net because you get six extra waters in and six extra waters out. This will explain the process of transpiration, which we'll talk about much, much later in biology. Both stages of photosynthesis occur in the chloroplast. The semi-fluid interior, which is called the stroma, 
is the site for the second series of photosynthesis reactions, the light independent reactions. Flattened sacs called thylakoids are interconnected by channels woven through the stroma. The first reactions of photosynthesis, so the light dependent reactions happen there. In the thylakoid membranes, pigments clustered together in the structures called photosystems, each consisting of 200 to 300 pigment molecules capable, capable of trapping the different energies from the sun. So in review, you can see that photosynthesis takes place in two stages, but it also takes place in two different parts of the chloroplast. The light dependent reactions and the light independent reactions. For an overview of what goes in and what comes out, you can see that water is split into two parts. One produces oxygen, which happens in the light dependent reactions, and the other combines with the, the hydrogens with the carbon dioxide to form glucose. Light dependent reactions really focus on making three things, ATP, NADPH, and oxygen. The electron transfer chains move electrons and hydrogen ions from the stroma into the thylakoids. The hydrogen ions accumulate inside the thylakoid compartment, and as the hydrogen ions flow th through the channels into the stroma, ATP synthase enzymes link inorganic phosphate to ADP to form ATP, which is the high energy molecule carrier. By the process of photolysis, water is split to form oxygen, which diffuses out, and hydrogen ions, which are maintained at high numbers in the thylakoid. Electrons are also transferred via another photosystem to NADP to form NADPH. Okay, what that basically means is, in the light-dependent reactions, oxygen is produced and energy is produced. The NADP, NADPH system is really only a truck that just carries stuff from one, photos, uh, from one group of reactions to the next one. That's all you need to know. Energy, oxygen, and a truck to carry stuff. In the light independent reactions, these reactions constitute a pathway known as the Calvin-Benson cycle. This is going to be confusing, so you need to know that this one's Calvin-Benson cycle. There's another one that sounds very similar later. The participants and their roles in the synthesis of carbohydrates are ATP, which provides energy, NADPH, which provides hydrogen atoms and electrons, remember that's the truck, and atmospheric air, which produces carbon and oxygen from carbon dioxide. These reactions take place in the stroma of the chloroplasts and are not dependent on sunlight. They can happen at nighttime. They don't always, but they can. Carbon dioxide will diffuse into a leaf across the plasma membrane of a photosynthetic cell. However, there are different kinds of plants and different types of carbon fixing pathways. There's a type called C4 plants and C3 plants. Plants in hot, dry environments close their stomata, the pores in their leaves, to conserve water, but in doing so, retard the amount of carbon dioxide that can enter the plant and permit oxygen buildup inside the leaves. C3 plants, such as beans, don't do well without irrigation in hot, dry climates, but C4 plants do. Crabgrass, sugarcane, corn, and other C4 plants will fix carbon twice, which can then donate the carbon dioxide into the Calvin-Benson cycle, so it prevents that oxygen buildup. The even more plants, uh, more advanced plants, are the CAM plants. CAM stands for Crassulacean Acid Metabolism, and plants such as cacti and other succulents open their stomata and fix carbon dioxide only at night, which prevents water loss, storing the intermediate product for use in photosynthesis the next day. The oceans are teeming with bacteria and protists, which provide food for nearly all other marine organisms. In an ocean ecosystem, the tiniest photosynthesizers are food for the crustaceans, which are eaten by fishes, seabirds, and even whales. One spring bloom of these organisms stretch from North Carolina past Spain. I mean, they're huge. Such large masses influence the global climate by sponging up nearly half of the carbon dioxide used in carbon fixation. So all those greenhouse gases are getting absorbed by these tiny little microscopic organisms. 
Human activities such as burning fossil fuels and setting fires for vast clear-cutting released more carbon dioxide than photoautotrophs can take up. Additionally, tons of waste and other pollutants are daily entering the oceans and may ultimately impact the photosynthetic function of these photoautotrophs. So in summary, it's not the rainforests that make the oxygen, it's the oceans, and it's the top two inches of the ocean's surface. So when you think about oil spills or the Great Pacific Garbage Patch or things like that, think about this because this is where your oxygen comes from, ladies and gentlemen. Um, but enough with that soapbox, and you have a fantastic day.